Well, welcome to today's special webinar, jointly hosted by the China Focus blog, the 21st Century China Center, and the 1990 Institute. This webinar is recorded. It will be available on our website, china.ucsd.edu in a few days. My name is Lei Guang. I'm the executive director of the 21st Century China Center. The center has one of the largest contingents of scholars who work on China and US-China relations. Much of that work is policy relevant. Some lead directly to policy products such as our most recent report on the US science and technology policy toward China that was issued in November last year. But what makes the center really unique from other standalone think tanks is that we are based in an educational institution, a university that trains young professionals in international affairs. Our students are creative, energetic, engaged, and thoughtful. They are our future leaders. Several years ago, our center worked with a group of such talented students at GPS to create China Focus, an online students-run magazine devoted to sharing original, content-rich, and contextualized analysis by the younger generation of students of China. Since 2016, China Focus has organized an annual essay contest among the students from the US and the Chinese universities on a particular topic that is reviewed and discussed by the faculty at the center. Today, we are delighted to have this inaugural webinar um, for the four prize winners in this year's essay contest. Rachel Lezo, the editor-in-chief for the China Focus, will moderate the panel discussion with these four students. But before I bring Rachel and the panel up, I want to extend a special thank you to the Fudan UC Center on Contemporary China, also based at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and also Northern California-based 1990 Institute for partnering with us this year. So without further ado, I would like to ask Mr. Dan Chow, the chair of the board at the 1990 Institute to offer a few remarks. Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Lei. Um, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks for having the 1990 Institute as a co-sponsor of the uh, College Essay Contest. I'd like to thank the 21st Century China Institute, the Fudan University, the um, China Focus for putting this on. Um, and also the, the professors, graduate students, and the essay writers. Um, just a little bit about the 1990 Institute. We have a dual mission of uh, promoting constructive dialogue uh, between the peoples of the US and China and to champion fair and equitable treatment of Asian Americans in the US. Um, we focus on teachers and educators and we hope to uh, make the overall American society more aware of US-China issues as well as on Asian Americans. Uh, we want to educate them with objective information based on, on data. Uh, and we hope to get people more interested. And so this contest is, accomplishes all three objectives. Uh, and so we're very happy to participate uh, and um, uh, hope that uh, people will stay involved and even participate with 1990 Institute. We run a number of programs, including webinars, podcasts, uh, a twice a month newsletter, and, um, and a video series. And so please come to our website, www.1990institute.org or .com. And uh, hope you can participate. Uh, lastly, I'd like to congratulate our four winners and also uh, say thanks to all the other participants. Um, as I understand it, there are there were participants from 12 nationalities in about 30 universities. So uh, congratulations to the four winners. I look forward to a, a very interesting uh, dialogue amongst you all. The, the essays were really excellent. So thanks very much to all of you. 
Now, turn it back to Rachel. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today, especially to our four panelists. Um, they wrote excellent essays that I had taken part in reviewing myself. So um, they've seen me mainly just through like extensive email chains. But um, for those who don't know me, my name is Rachel. I'm the editor in chief for China Focus, um, and I'll be moderating today. Mainly, like the first thing that we're going to be doing is asking each panelist to introduce the topic, um, their main argument, and also some supporting evidence. And uh, we also want to know how did they come up with this topic as their interest, and how does it relate to their um, path of study? And then finally, where do they think that US and China relations will end up in 10 years? So there will be plenty of time for some follow up questions that um, I have just prepped in case everyone's shy. Um, and we'll also hear from from you all in the audience for any Q&A. So um, yeah, I think Sam will be helping to flag me if I don't stop. And uh, yeah, I'll love to hear your questions. I'm sure the panelists will be happy to reply to you all. Um, so out of our essay winners, we first are going to have uh, Sean. So, so just a quick introduction on Sean. Um, he is a student or a master's student at Peking Yu with the Yen Ching Academy and is also a non-resident fellow with Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for uh, Strategy and Security. Um, so, so basically one thing I wanna say is our four students come from very different backgrounds and are all different ages and are at different points in their careers. So, so uh, stay tuned because it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. We have a lot of diversity and viewpoint. So Sean is from Singapore and has main research interests in tech, geopolitics and national security. So I'll turn it over to Sean. All right, thank you, Rachel, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone here from Singapore or good evening if you're in the US. Uh, so yeah, uh, my main argument is, my essay was about immigration. And my main argument here was essentially that Chinese students and also immigrant talent in general is a boon rather than a bane to the United States. Uh, so just to set up the framing for this, uh, this essay came in context of, I would say, many more collective anxieties about the role that stu Chinese students in particular play in the US, uh, the potential risk that they are perceived to bring to US economic and national security. And what I wanted to do was A, uh, dive into these and differentiate them a little because some of these anxieties are all lumped together. And then B, also push back a little because I think when you look at some of the statistics on this front, uh, these arguments become less scary. So there's two main arguments I wanted to cover. The first is uh, economic espionage, and then the second is uh, sort of uh, what I would call reverse brain drain. So on the first topic, uh, one argument that uh, gets trotted out often is that Chinese students, or has been trotted out often in the past few years, is that Chinese students are uh, sometimes part of a state-backed campaign, essentially to hoover up information from uh, US academic institutions and then take that back home to China. But if you look at the numbers, uh, the facts don't really bear out this case. Uh, CSIS has an excellent list of the number of uh, Chinese uh, linked espionage cases since 2000. Uh, it's about 150 cases long. That is maybe 10, under 10 a year. And now you compare that with the number of Chinese students in the US per year. Uh, that's something like 400,000. Uh, and then you start to see where the concerns here might be a little bit overstated and we might be a bit preemptive uh, if we do anything uh, aggressive on this front. Now, the other concern, though, I think is a bit more complex. And uh, so that is uh, the topic of this reverse brain drain, as you will. Uh, the fear being here that uh, you have students coming to the US uh, and you're educating them, but they may not be staying. They may be returning to their home country. And when they do, uh, they bring their knowledge with them. Now, depending on the type uh, of student you're talking about, this can be a fairly complex issue. So PhD students tend to stay in the US long-term. I think the stay rate is something like 95%. But if you look at masters and bachelor students, uh, the stay rate is uh, much lower, although it, there are much less statistics also about what it actually is. And, but my argument here is that rather than talking about necessarily deterring or wanting to repel these students, what you should be doing is try and retain them in the US, because uh, that would be uh, 
the best solution for both them and U.S. economic productivity. Uh, and you can do that by redesigning some aspects of the U.S. immigration pipeline, which I will not dive into because there are a lot of details there, but essentially trying to increase the number of green cards or H-1Bs that you have available to them. So that's my argument overall. And this is obviously a bit more of a, I would say, pro-immigration stance. Uh, and part of that, uh, this is how I came to this topic, is a personal interest in the matter. Uh, as a Singaporean who has spent time in both the US and China and been through both countries' immigration systems, uh, I can say that I have a bit of uh, resonance with how Chinese students, the plight that Chinese students currently face, being sort of caught between two worlds, uh, but also from a more detached academic standpoint. I think this is a very relevant topic. Uh, one of my key interests is in technology and geopolitics. And if you're talking about, although I don't necessarily agree with the frame, with the competition in technology uh, or artificial intelligence or what have you, uh, then talent is a prime ingredient for that. You know, you, uh, you're going, you will live or, you live or die by the strength of your talent. Uh, so people like Matt Sheehan and Remco Sweatsloot have done a ton of interesting work on this, and I wanted to sort of expand their arguments and explore them a bit further. So where U.S.-China relations are going to be in the next 10 years, um, I'm personally not super optimistic on this specific topic. It's worth noting a big bipartisan divide. Uh, the last Pew Research poll had a big, uh, had I think 69% of Republicans supporting limiting Chinese students in the US versus 42% Democrats. And what that suggests is that future changes in administration may have an outsized impact on the fate of immigrants. And if you are an immigrant trying to plan out the next five, 10 years, that may make you reluctant to sink time into trying to stay in the US, You know buying your house, uh, having kids, again, uh, what, what have you. And in the more general sense also, I think it's difficult to see internal dynamics within each of the two countries cooling down for now. Um, I'm hopeful that the tensions uh, are contained. And I think we can agree that it would be a win for everybody if there were no armed conflict, for example, over any of the flashpoints uh, in East Asia right now. But I would love to hear from the other panelists as well. And so thanks for your time. Uh, I'll hand it back to Rachel. Thank you, Sean, for a very comprehensive response. And you remembered everything that I asked from you, which is really impressive. Um, so next we have Theo, um, and I'll do a brief introduction uh, for him as well. He also happens to be, coincidentally, a Yenching scholar at Peking U. Um, but it seems like he and Sean aren't from the same year. Um, and Theo is pursuing a master's in China studies and he graduated from Harvard, um, uh, concentrating in both social studies, um, East Asian studies, and even some computer science. So currently he's interning at the Center on uh, Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Um, and he's also very interested in researching media in Hong Kong. So I'll turn it to Theo. Awesome, yeah, uh, hey, great to be here. Um, so I guess one of the origins of my essay was a couple, a couple years back, when I was talking to a friend whose parent worked at Microsoft and he described his work as he's a plumber. Um, and I think as I've kind of gotten more into computer science stuff, both talking to people and thinking about it myself, I think that metaphor is really good uh, for basically what everyone does in computer science. Everyone to an extent is a plumber. Um, and I think that's, maybe somewhat mo what motivates my essay of, uh, I think it's kind of funny that when you think about like water as a resource, right? Like plumbers don't own water. You know, the, the government owns the water and the plumbers just do things on the side. The internet is this weird funky space in which the plumbers actually run the system. Uh, and they've made very intentional choices that, that no one owns the internet, you know, the water here, but the plumbers are the ones who are making most of the important rules. Um, and so that's really the subject of my essay. Um, and I think the, maybe the core assumption is that, you know, who, who makes the rules as much as tech might build itself as these, this morally neutral thing that's good for humanity, you know, has these large economic, political, and geostrategic implications. And so uh, because the U.S. did essentially invent the internet, uh, it had this huge head start on this rulemaking process, uh, both systematically as well as in the trenches of the, of the, of the actual standards and things like that. Um, and so this is not necessarily a super innovative new idea, but uh, there's generally been a lot of talk, I think, about um, China catching up on this front. And I might put, you know, kind of two major 
don't know if threats is the right word, but at least from a US perspective, but I think was what the essay asked for, uh, things you'd look out for. And one would be China kind of flipping the system. And so um, that's the major subject of my essay is that you know, we have this regime in which the plumbers are making the rules. And as you can imagine, if you're a government, you don't totally love that. Um, as well as I think there is a certain amount of, you know, the plumbers not necessarily having comprehensive view of, of different things. And China is sort of leading the charge along with Russia uh, on switching that up. And so uh, I would argue that, that has implications on licensing, uh, you know, who owns contracts uh, politically, you know, obviously who owns the internet has certain values embedded in it and how, it, how it's designed. And then lastly, if you're strategically, you know, spying and cyber espionage and warfare are all obviously uh, in some ways baked into the backbone of how the internet works. And uh, the last, you know, the second way in which China's catching up is, uh, you know, beyond just changing the system, you know, even working within the system, uh, we can talk about Chinese innovation and there's all sorts of debates about that. I think at very least it's very clear right now that uh, you said that CS is plumbing. Uh, China is very good at producing plumbers, right? You know, uh, there's lots and lots of software engineers out there who are Chinese who are, you know, going to outnumber as a mode, right? Uh, U U.S. people on the in these bodies, and so I asked a little bit more on the the, the Sean and labor issue, but I think it's something to think about. Um, See, so yeah, I guess the last thing about the U.S. Uh, ten years from now, uh, yeah, we're usually pretty bad at predictions, so nothing too aggressive. I think. Uh, competition, at least from my angle, is probably more accurate of uh, there will always be a need to win contracts, to try to, you know, be, be the one who sets the rules. And so that's not going away regardless of whether or not uh, relations improve or, or decline in the next 10 years. Okay, thank you, Theo. Um, and it's already amazing to see that we have like difference in, di differences in viewpoints, even though these two come from the same master's program, essentially. So um, so next we have Jimin. Um, and Jimin is an undergrad at the University of Kansas, and he's studying uh, political science and global studies. And he's a member of the KU policy debate team and the trade war lab. And he is very interested in East Asian geopolitics, uh, international relations, and climate geoengineering. So I'll have Jim and talk for a bit on the same topics. Uh, hi, everyone. So I guess I'll first, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the introduction, Rachel. Um, and uh, I guess my essay topic came up because I guess my senior year in high school, the debate topic was immigration. It's something I've kind of always been passionate about. And it seems like especially under the past presidential administration, you know, we're always looking for more justifications to, you know, exclude certain groups of people outside of the country. So it's good to think about, you know, maybe the potential benefits of immigration. So I make a couple points in my essay. Um, the first one is kind of similar to Sean's, where it's like we have these, a large group of especially Chinese students who are innovative, you know, very intelligent, and we should welcome them into the country instead of trying to, you know, deem them as national security threats. But I think I have sort of two other criticisms of the way that, you know, people frame immigration. And again, Sean kind of mentioned it in the technological sector, but the idea of competition, uh, it probably is not true in the area of immigration. We constantly talk about the war on talent. You know, if we took a worker from China, brought them to the U.S., you know, that's a loss for China. So my essay kind of argues that this is not true. And rather than what scholars call brain drain, we have something called brain gain. So like when countries like China lose their workers to the U.S., they do all they can to improve their domestic conditions. So like improve their education. They have like an artificial intelligence park. They pay people more money. So it improves not only the US's, you know, economy and, you know, different types of innovation, but also, you know, this, the sending country, whether it's China, India, et cetera. Also, there are like cultural ties that develop between the two countries that are especially important. They're more non-tangible. Uh, there's a concept of remittances where, you know, uh, immigrants send money back, financial capital, et cetera, that also kind of indicate that rather than a war on talent, it should be viewed as a more competitive sphere. And I think the most important point that my essay makes is that there is a specific type of migrant that, you know, is not really talked about when we talk about like the econ economic benefits of immigration, and that's um, refugees. And my essay makes a pretty important point that's like, Im immigrants generally are, are very good for the economy, but refugees according to the evidence I've cited, um, are the most innovative and most likely to start businesses out of any other type of immigration or immigrant group. And we don't really talk about that. And I think that's something that, you know, we should talk about in regards to um, US-China competition, because if we let in a large group of refugees, we wouldn't have to quote unquote, you know, steal workers from China 
in order to one up them in uh, like, you know, the area of, era of competition because there's a lot of individuals in European countries that are like intermediary countries and like Jordan and Lebanon that are just waiting to come to, you know, whether it's the US or countries in Europe. And um, that would kind of address the concerns that many people have with immigration, you know, because we wouldn't be draining economies because those refugees just need a place to stay regardless of where it, it's at. And I think uh, the last thing I'd like to address is like my predictions on the future of US-Chinese relations, similarly to everyone else, I think, you know, they're unlikely to, you know, warm up anytime soon. It seems like it seems like it's pretty politically popular to remain hard hardline on China. Um, Biden has kind of emphasized supporting uh, military alliances in East Asia that are antagonistic to China with South Korea and Japan. So my my, my personal opinion is that within the next decade, um, nothing substantive will probably occur. Thank you. Okay, now last but not least, we'll hear from William. So William is an Arnold A. Uh, Saltzman Scholar at Columbia University, and he's studying political science in East Asian languages and cultures. So currently he's doing research on US-China relations for Professor Thomas Christenden um, and Professor uh, Maria Karai at the Columbia, Harvard, China and the World Program. So he served as an intern at CSIS with the Freeman Chair before, um, and his research interests are international trade, modern Chinese history, and international security. So, um, William, let's hear from you. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here and present my essay. Um, I guess to first start with what got me interested in uh, the topic, which I wrote about international trade, and what it's, it's kind of what got me interested in China to begin with, which was the opportunity to study abroad. I studied abroad in Beijing and Changchun, and I guess in those summers and experiences, I really saw the benefits of globalization, uh, the benefits of interconnected cultures, whether it's conversations with locals about NBA basketball teams. Um, I remember discussing like Modern Family with my roommate and him showing me his favorite Chinese TV show, Chi Pa Shuo, which I now really enjoy watching, um, playing basketball with my host family, um, just really great memories. And I guess for me, I experienced a lot of benefits when it comes to citizen diplomacy and international exchange. Um, and that's, I think that's very related to globalization. Um, and so that's kind of what inspired, inspired my essay, which is about international trade. And specifically I'm making an argument that China has seized the mantle of international trade leadership in the Asia Pacific from the United States. And looking at two main pieces of evidence here, the first is China's expanding influence in the World Trade Organization. And the second is its signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which I'll call RCEP. Um, a lot of these uh, free trade agreements have very complex and convoluted like acronyms. So um, RCEP and uh, that's kind of what was happening when I wrote this essay. So RCEP, arguably the world's largest free trade agreement, it's projected to add $500 billion to world GDP by 2030. And I think what really um, sort of magnified the significance of China signing RCEP, which the US is not part of, was um, the fact that the US under the President Trump's administration withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, in 2017, and basically left a vacuum in terms of uh, international trade leadership in Asia. And that has that same attitude has also manifested in the World Trade Organization, where China has been a vigorous supporter of the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. The U.S. under Trump actually blocked the appointment of WTO appellate judges to that body and basically didn't allow it to function in the way it was intended to. And so I'm really pointing out a key difference between the United States and China, which is sort of the willingness of their leaders and the willingness of their domestic constituencies to embrace multilateralism and to embrace um, globalization and the benefits it causes, whereas China is signing free trade agreements like RCEP and you know, putting out its trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative project, the US has sort of withdrawn into this economic nationalism. And that while that started under Trump, and that was a big appeal of his message, um, that's continued under President Biden. And it looks like it will continue for, for a while. And so I think I really conclude the essay pointing out that the US, despite pioneering this liberal international order and this international trading system, seems to have lost significant faith in its own system. And I think that is, um, you know, that's very concerning. Uh, 
from, you know, I'm, I'm definitely taking a pro globalization standpoint. I think it's done tremendous good. And so I guess that, that, that's kind of summarizing my argument. And in terms of the future of the US China relationship, I agree with um, the lack of optimism for what's been said before. Um, I, I will just add one thing. I think the President Biden has really emphasized strong security relationships with East Asia, but security relationships don't go without economic relationships. I think if the US cannot demonstrate that it's a stable and reliable partner on these international trade agreements, it's gonna make countries reluctant to engage with us on other issues. Um, we can't we can't have have it one way and not and, and not the other. And so I think one really fundamental question that the transition from Trump to Biden raised is this issue of continuity in democratic societies. If if Donald Trump can do one thing and it's gonna be completely reserved, reversed when the next administration comes in, and that's gonna be completely overturned when the next administration from a different party comes in, there's a big, big question about who can we trust, um, I guess from, from East Asian leaders' perspectives, who can we trust in the United States um, and, and, and how can we trust that continuity is, gonna, is going to be there on these policies? And so the US really needs to show that it's gonna be a reliable partner. And, and that's kind of what I'll say about the future of the US-China relationship. Thank you, William. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sam to see if we have any uh, questions from the audience that we should take a break for so that I could ask those before I keep, keep chugging. <laughs> Sam, do we have anything? Maybe not. Okay, so um, my next question is related to media coverage. And I know a couple of you did uh, briefly mention this. So I was wondering, um, what do you see missing in mainstream discourse? Um, of course, those of you who didn't really mention media, like I'm, I'm definitely looking at you for the, the, this question. Um, and also like for, for all of you, how do you suggest that we broaden media coverage and make sure that the research is diverse and actually cover some of these issues that are maybe like less touched upon in, in our daily news cycle. So any of you could take a stab at it and I could give a second for you all to think, um, but yeah, feel free to jump in. Yeah, so I guess I can go first, uh, although uh, since I was first in the order, although I don't necessarily have a good answer to this, I would say, um, but Honestly speaking, I would say uh, one thing that I think is missing uh, is just stories about, uh, and this is not a geopolitical thing, but stories about what it's like to like live in China from an, a more ordinary person's perspective. I think there's a very strong emphasis on uh, some of the geopolitical angles uh, nowadays, but, uh, and, you know, technology, so on and so forth. But there is, I think, a shortage of, you know, um, some of these more uh, in-person uh, or I would say maybe pop culture or so on deep dives, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jimin, go ahead and then we'll go to Theo. I think another thing that is important is like, I mean, I think oftentimes like the media, like the headlines are often like so hyperbolic and silly. So like you'll see this most often like in terms of like territorial disputes, like I'll see like headlines that are like the dragon, like and closes its claws or something. It's just like, I mean, it's, 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 it's just like so out of proportion. It's like, yes, like great powers do things like, like, you know, they, they attempt to control islands, but it just seems like a lot of things are hyperbolic. And there's also seems to be the notion that like somehow being pro China is just like unpopular or like disingenuous in the US. It's like, oh, you're caving into Xi's agenda. It's like, I think, you know, citing more evidence, being more factual and less hyperbolic would be super important for the media. Yeah, um, I'll take a slightly niche answer because I think for my essay, it makes sense of, I think if you read or listen to my answer, right, the kind of moral of the story is become a plumber. Um, and I, I, I it, you know, it's an easy answer, I think, for this one of uh, there are not, I think, enough people who, or I guess I should say the, the takeaway from my essay, if you believe my hypothesis is right, is that you need to be able, uh, you know, these technolog technological standards are important um, in a variety of different fields, political, economic, and geostrategic. Uh, I think there's probably a need for more people who speak, I think, multiple languages in terms of A, Chinese, and then B, some of the technical stuff, whether it be like biology, computer science, so on and so forth. Um, and so I wish there'd be more paper. I mean, I think because we're an educational institution, 
it's easy to call those, just point out those levers, uh, maybe in kind of like a very liberal arts way. Uh, you know, I wish there'd be more people who were co-writing, you know, CS, you know, East Asian studies papers, or just, you know, East Asian studies people who had, you know, stronger technical backgrounds, because I do think these are the issues that will be important going forward. Um, and so, yeah, I guess maybe more Justin Sherman's, more, you know, King Pan Roberts in the world, I think would help in this front, both in like academia, as well as, of course, journalism. Uh, great. And uh, William, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, qualify or see if, um, you know, looking back on my essay, if this wasn't communicated clearly enough. But uh, one thing I think media coverage is missing is expectations related to trade agreements. Um, I think uh, trade agreements are often codifying and formalizing a lot of sort of like relationships that were already there. And so whenever a new trade agreement is signed, especially when it's um, like in the context of US versus China competition and geopolitical competition, there's a lot of discussion about what it means and sort of the dramatic implications it can have for job loss. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how trade agreements are potentially bringing about income inequality and, and it, it becomes very dramatic. And I, so I think in my essay, I tried to communicate that, but it, it's kind of hard because um, you know, obviously when a trade agreement is signed, it's a, is signed, it's timely news. And so a lot of coverage comes out about that. I just wanted to add that, um, you know, they're very much just, these are long gradual processes that are um, formalizing a lot of things that have already been existent. And so it's uh, important not to overstate uh, the significance sometimes. Yeah, uh, and sorry, just to jump in again, because uh, I realized there were two other things that I wanted to add. So uh, one is, uh, I think a great example of what I was talking about, more focus on sort of uh, the society level, maybe. Uh, there's a substack out there called Chaoyang Trap House, which is uh, C-H-A-O-Y-A-N-G, uh, Trap House, uh, that covers essentially uh, internet culture uh, in China, which I think is super interesting, and a lot of the pieces are very original, um, worth checking out. Uh, number two, I think another thing that would be especially interesting is, uh, and is undercovered, I think there are some very great parallels in sort of the challenges of the tech ecosystem in both the US and China. So for example, the gig economy uh, is something that has received a lot of attention in China as well as the US. But, and I think it would be really interesting to do more work, uh, see more work, like linking those two together. There is some already, if I remember correctly, but I think more would be great. Thanks, Sean. And actually this, it's perfect that you jumped back in because we did get a couple of audience questions. I hope I could call him out. Um, Professor Victor Shi asked two really great questions, one for Sean, one for Theo. So I'll start since Sean, you're already up and going. Uh, I'll say that uh, Professor Shi wanted to ask, uh, do you think that the latest drive in China to intensify uh, ideological education is helping China's attempt to attract tech talent? Um, I would say probably, uh, probably not. Uh, actually, I'm curious uh, if, uh, in what specific uh, way uh, this uh, a professor she is talking thinking about. Um, but it doesn't strike me that it would personally. Um, uh, so I could wait for maybe maybe Victor could type out another response to that, but in the meantime, I'll ask his question to Theo. Um, okay, Victor already has typed. He's very quick. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I don't know, Sean. Do you see the the? the okay. Yeah, I guess uh, it's more for uh, it's more for me that I would imagine this would be counterproductive, uh, but I'm not actually uh, super tapped into uh, the dynamics here. Uh, I don't imagine that it would be attractive to uh, tech talent necessarily, but that's my personal perspective just off the top of my head. Um, okay, so I'll ask uh, Professor Xi's question to uh, Theo now. So how do 
really intensify tech competition vis-a-vis -vis China without alienating our allies in Asia, who are already deeply integrated with the tech production chain in China? Yeah, I mean, A, great question. I think B, not sure I have a great answer to the question. Um, I guess my initial thoughts, though, would be that um, to the extent that tech competition is about producing the best product, kind of fair and square, I imagine most East Asia, or most of the allies in Asia, yeah, are short term can be picked off about um, you know changes in in the market, but long term, I guess, is they would be willing to sell to whoever you know the best buyer is. And so, um, to that front, I think it's not a huge deal long term. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in supply chain. Um, I guess part of it is part of the problem here is that tech competition is, I think. Well, whereas the trade war has a pretty kind of clear here are some actions and policies that are taking place have kind of again clear rules, the tech sent the tech war and tech decoupling. I think these concepts are still very much in the early stages of what they're going to look like. Um, I guess the most concrete example of like the tech war would be the Huawei case. And at least from my perspective, the Huawei case is not some existential threat to supply chains in East Asia. Um, I think so far. Uh, in terms of smartphones, at least, and this is the most like this is the kind of token example. I'm sure other markets are different. You know, the other smaller Chinese smartphone companies of like Vivo, Xiaomi, are the ones picking up a lot of the slack that Huawei is is losing in that market. And so, um, you know, not to say that all Chinese companies are exactly, exactly the same, but the extent that supply chains are you know, nationally based, I don't think it'll be massively disruptive. Uh, or at least the, the token example so far is, is that way. Um, but again. I am not an expert on supply chains, and I think you could pro you could probably find someone who disagrees with me very strongly about you know how production would would massively you know, nuke the the Vietnamese economy if things shifted. But that's my best first guess. Um, and I think Victor has a bit of a follow up. <laughs> so um, it seems like it seems like it's just a comment. So yeah, got it. So he's he's talking more about networking as opposed to like uh like sub supply chain like production yeah no um that makes sense i mean uh I, I think it is a constant question of i think national security versus um or i guess sovereignty maybe, maybe more, more of a better word there um versus economics um i think the the, the short answer is the u.s needs to do a better job of supplying quality quality equipment um, so I know that's not a great answer of because they don't, um, but to say that competition is like I talk about competition, uh, I think it shouldn't be a nasty word for Germany or the UK because it should be about supplying the best product and the most cheaply available product. Um, but I understand kind of the concrete implications of that right now are not going to be fun for them, and so I don't have a great answer to how to, how you explain to Germany, oh, like by the way, um, this is going to cost you this much money to do better. Okay, great. Thanks, Theo. Um, and we have a question from Lei. So, and this is specifically directed to uh, William. So, do you see changes in the way the young people in China think about the U.S.? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I, I guess, being pretty young myself, I, I don't know if I can speak to the changes, but I guess I, one contrast I do see is the media depictions of you know U.S.-China conflict and my anecdotal experiences studying in China and just experiencing a lot of, hearing a lot of sincere admiration for the US, its culture, its freedoms. Um, and that always really just struck me because it's, it's a huge contrast to the media portrayals about the conflict and competition that exists in the US-China relationship. And so I, you know, I, I've, I'm always stunned by how much more, like, I guess I'm a pretty avid basketball fan, um, but how much more about the NBA, like Chinese people that I played with in Changchun knew, like they knew all the rosters of the most random basketball teams. Um, and in like, you know, in conversations with taxi drivers, just how much they loved talking about American politics and asking about life in the US. And I, I think that has always, you know, that that's left a huge imprint on me. I think it's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more room for cooperation and and just like again how much they love Hollywood movies um, it, it always really impresses me and one thing I 
wanted to add was there's often this question of like, do people think that China will one day become a democracy? I've actually discussed this question pretty extensively with Professor Christensen, uh, who I've worked with. Um, and I mean, we kind of both think that uh, China will eventually become a democracy, maybe not in 10 years, maybe not in 50 years, but I think it's sort of the trend. And I think a lot of people in China do have admiration for the open system in the US. Great, uh, so our next question, I think that Dan was wanting to ask something. So um, Dan, maybe you could just unmute and, and ask the two panelists that you were interested in. Okay, yeah, for the, the two um, essayists who wrote about immigration, um, you did include uh, some suggested solutions. And I just thought maybe you could bring them out a bit and chat about them as to how can we overcome this negative atmosphere on immigration uh, and this concern over cybersecurity and IP theft, uh, given that both Democrats and Republicans feel kind of the same way. How do we go over overcome this? Yeah, uh, I'm happy to go first. So I do actually think there are some uh, differences uh, between Democrats and Republicans in where exactly the concerns lie. Uh, I think both are concerned about uh, economic espionage, uh, but I think uh, the, because you have two potential vectors, I guess, for economic espionage. You have sort of the cybersecurity angle, uh, where, uh, which is not related to immigration per se. And then you do have this uh, immigration angle. Um, I, again, I don't think, uh, I can say definitively this, uh, I don't have statistics on this, but I think uh, it tends to be that uh, Republicans tend to be more concerned about both angles, the immigration as well as the cyber angle. And Democrats tend to be, uh, right now I think are a bit more focused on the cyber angle. Um, because if you look at, uh, for example, earlier this year, uh, I think pr uh, President Biden proposed a new bill, which I don't know the status of actually. I don't, I think it's probably, uh, or probably stalled. But one of the provisions of that was to raise the number of green cards uh, for uh, STEM uh, people working or studying in STEM fields, uh, PhDs particularly, if I remember correctly. And so that would not necessarily be targeted at Chinese students per se, but uh, China, I think, is uh, the second highest uh, number contribution second highest contributor of STEM talent, India being the first uh, in terms of like annual uh, enrollment numbers or annual green card applications, say. Uh, and so that would naturally help out uh, Chinese students as well. So I think that a bill like that would be helpful to pass. And one of my arguments was that it probably will be hard to pass a comprehensive bill, which is uh, what this originally was tabled as, uh, and what Democrats might have to do if they want to push this through would be to push something more something more piecemeal through. So focusing specifically maybe on like this green card dimension. Uh, another thing that I mentioned was uh, for uh, H-1B visas specifically. And so the H-1B visa is a temporary uh, work visa that sort of bridges, uh, I guess in the life of an international student, there are sort of three stages. There's you as a student, uh, and then maybe the work study permits that you get alongside of that. There's the H-1B temporary work visa and then green card application if you want to become a permanent resident. The H-1Bs are a bit harder to work, I think, uh, I uh, because there are some political sensitivities around those um, and more of them are being given out. But if you issue more, that just creates a backlog in green cards because then you have people, a whole bunch of people on temporary work visas who cannot uh, apply for permanent residency because of various constraints in that process. So I think it does make more sense to focus on the latter part of the process as well, which is the approach that the Biden administration seems to be taking. Awesome. Um, and Jimin, I know that you wrote about immigration as well. Is there anything that you would like to add or you mainly just agree with uh, Sean's points? Uh yeah, yeah, I'd also just like to add two things. I think one is just like, um, I, I didn't write this in my essay, but it seems like fears of espionage are often overinflated. 
because I, I think people kind of like there's just like in order for them to commit espionage, they would have to send someone willing to dedicate like years and years of time to study in the U.S. undercover. And the U.S. intelligence community is so good at doing background checks, like the likelihood they're discovered is pretty high. And it just takes so much like work and effort to pull off that operation that the chance that it happens is, sub is substantially lower than all, all the like kind of benefits that um, Chinese students would bring, which I think Sean talked about at the beginning of this webinar. Um, so I, yeah, I think they're definitely overplayed. And two is like the solution I outlined in my essay kind of avoids a lot of the security issues that, you know, policymakers have, um, like, you know, obviously they're concerned about IP theft, but refugees are not typically associated with like large countries like, you know, China and Russia. So um, that would kind of bypass concerns that we have. Thank you so much to both of you for the insightful answers. Um, so now Lei has uh, actually two questions and they're directed to all of you. Um, I'll, I'll just go with the first one and then hear from your thoughts and then we'll, we'll move on to the second one. So, so first, uh, why do you think that there's an imbalance between the number of American students going to China versus Chinese students coming to the US? Go ahead. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Theo, go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think it can be attributed to two things. One explanation being potentially more charitable to Americans and the other less so. Um, the first being, I, I think it's there's a pretty clear consensus that y the U.S. still boasts, you know, the top universities in the world, and so Xi Jinping has obviously very much stressed the importance of trying to build Tsinghua and Beida into serious competitors on the international stage. But I, you know, global consensus probably remains that Harvard, Yale, the schools we that we have in the U.S. are going to be the best in the world that everyone wants to go to, Americans included, Chinese people included. The second explanation that's a little bit less charitable to Americans is just sort of American hubris. I think a huge part is a lack of awareness around other nations' foreign policies, around their news and their current affairs, um, just sort of an attitude that a lot of the world revolves around the US. And obviously that's gonna date back to the unipolar moment that the US enjoyed after the Cold War. But I think we're slowly coming to the realization, if not already, that the world does not revolve around the United States. And so um, I think they're just, that's continuing to be a conversation that I've enjoyed pushing and being part of, whether it's seeing the explosion of Mandarin immersion programs in the United States or you know bilingual immersion programs. I think there's a definite effort, um, but I think some of that thinking is still, still in the US where we think that um, you know, we don't have to go abroad that uh, everyone everyone is coming here and talking about our events and we can just do the same. Um, but again, I've been really thrilled to see that that is changing. Yeah, I'll just tack on. I think yeah, I agree with his points. Um, as a student who's supposed to be studying in China and I've written, I think my undergraduate thesis about this. Um, a, language is obviously the big thing. Of like it, in, in China, this education system definitely incentivizes learning English early on. Um, whereas just there's not that many Mandarin speakers. And so if you want to do research in Mandarin, you have a pretty small subset of American people who can do that. Um, the second is just, I think Chinese universities have not quite figured it out yet of how, how to attract students. I mean, uh, I think one of the benefits and drawbacks of the US system is we've invested a ton of money <laughs> in making this whole holistic experience, especially at the undergraduate level. And at the graduate level, funding students definitely is a big deal. And for China, given its kind of per capita GDP and just other, you know, the size of its system, to be able at scale to fund that sort of investment. I mean, if you think about US education costing 60,000. Uh oh, I think it looks like we have lost Theo for a second. Um, so we'll see, we'll see if he comes back. <laughs> I can jump oh, in. Yeah, okay, if, if you'd like to jump in, sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't have much to add, but I think- uh, Dollars, right? Can the Chinese, you know, at a top level. Uh, sorry, Theo, we lost you for a second there. Okay, am I back now? Yes, you're back. Yeah, I, I think the point is just that like, uh, you know, the American education complex, it means that students expect the value of X dollars and to fund that at a Chinese university 
it's possible at the highest levels. You can see the 10,000 talent program, but to do that at scale um, is hard right now. It's something they're getting better at, you know. Yeah, fully seconded uh, for both the panelists' answers. And I do think uh, one of the big factors is definitely the network effect, the fact that the US has right now as its advantage, uh, the fact that it is able, it's sort of a uh, positive cycle, positive feedback loop. But because the US attracts so many of the world's top talents, it is able to maintain its position as uh, you know, the hub for global talent. Um, and so I think that's a big part of why that's very hard for, uh, I think, other countries to break, uh, so to speak. But that is also, I think, why the US uh, has the, that has the potential to, US immigration policy has a huge potential to affect its own competitiveness, because the US is the most likely one to be the one breaking that cycle if it interrupts that flow of talent. And things I imagine could change substantially in terms of the global flow of education if that were to happen. Thank you so much to everyone who answered um, Lay's question. And I think we have time for one more. So I don't see anything from, from the rest of the audience, but uh, if there is, like, please flag me, somebody. Um, and if not, I'll go to Lay's second question, um, also directed to everyone. Um, so how have, your how have your views of China changed over time, if they have? And since all of you are more or less China scholars who've been doing this for either years or have like, you know, done it intensively for a couple of years or just recently, um, like regardless, do you think that studying China has caused you to like kind of change your perspective since when you first kind of got an interest in China? So anyone want to take a stab at this one? I mean, you can raise hands just, just so that we could prevent um, y'all jumping in at once. Okay, go ahead, Jimin. Thank you. Um, I guess like I'm only like you know t two years into this, you know, and some of you have been doing this longer. But something that uh, that struck me is kind of just like a lot of issues surrounding China are really complex, and it seems like Americans, you know, and just like other people who like I've talked to, really simplify these large complex issues into just like just like ignore a lot of the nuances. Like I think a lot of people mentioned earlier, it is so politically popular to just be like, you know, China's extremely scary. I couldn't believe you caved, you know, to an authoritarian. But I think that's something that I've, I've kind of realized and I think it's important to understand. So I guess like my takeaway is just that it is important to, you know, people like us and, you know, groups like the China Focus uh, um, to like kind of continue to study um, these complex issues because a lot of people are unwilling to. Yeah, uh, and I can hop in uh, on that. So I guess, I mean, I, I feel like I wouldn't be willing either to call myself a China scholar or China expert by any means. I also uh, fell into this sort of belatedly uh, only a couple of years ago. And I think one thing that uh, has changed for me is sort of, uh, I would say, gaining a more nuanced perspective on uh, the domestic, especially in the tech arena, the domestic capabilities that Chinese companies have. Um, there is, I think, a lot of hype in DC uh, uh, about, uh, you know, how China is like raising ahead in artificial intelligence, so on and so forth, um, which I think does not necessarily always match up to the ground realities, uh, because A, people don't fully understand uh, the domestic situation in China, B, people don't fully understand some of these technologies. Uh, and so you have very sweeping statements, for example, about say the social credit score and how far reaching it's supposed to be, which are not necessarily true. I think there are concerns that are legitimate and we need to bear in mind, such as, for example, in the surveillance technology domain. Uh, but I think uh, I've become a bit more cautious about these grand sweeping statements about what China is going to do next, uh, given its like technological superiority and so on. Okay, great. Um, I'll move it to Theo next, and then finally we'll have William. Yeah, no, and briefly, all what I would just add is that I think, um, I guess this sentence like advice of definitely going to China is a big deal, and I have not spent nearly enough spent nearly enough time in China. I wish I were there this year, um, but I think even from the outside looking in, 
my experience has kind of been the more you you dig in the more you're like ah, i actually don't get any i don't understand what's going on like sort of less you know type thing of this is kind of a stereotype itself but it's just a big country with lots of different things and until you're on the ground and can see things it's very very hard um to parse out any coherent view um which i think is kind of why i enjoy like pipe world where you you exist in a sandbox you have a set number of tools and you connect those things as opposed to you know understanding a, a network is different than understanding like oh what is china i think that one's a much more difficult problem but still i think a very interesting and important one obviously yeah and i think jumping off theo's point uh one sort of big catchword that i've that my understanding of has changed is the rise of china and, and you know what that means for the united states just that that phrase in general um i think one thing that's really stuck out to me in studying china is that no sort of the idea that no country has done more to assist China's rise since the reform and opening in the 1970s than the United States. And I really think that China is more of a multilateral and institutional cooperator than the United States gives it credit for. There are legitimate concerns to be raised about intellectual property rights, the influence of state-owned enterprises, and those are all important things to tackle. But I really think there's a lot more common ground than is commonly discussed. Um, you know, in 2005, we had Deputy Secretary of State call Robert Zellick call upon China to become a responsible stakeholder. And I think in many ways it has. And so I think it's important to recognize the challenge is not how do we push down the rise of China, rather the challenge is how do we align China's interests to and integrate it into this sort of liberal international order that we're all a part of. That's a great conclusion to our panel. And I think that we're up on time, so I'll hand it back over to Lei for a quick closing statement. And once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you especially to the panelists and everyone who hasn't read their essays. Please go check it out online in the chat box. Wow, what a talented group of writers and uh, thinkers. And I look forward to uh, hearing more and reading more about your writings on China in the future. And best of luck. And, uh, and good luck with your uh, next uh, phase of your intellectual engagement with China. And I hope that you will stay engaged with the China Focus Group as well. Thank you to all of you. And I also wanna thank the China Focus team that put in a lot of work. And thanks to Dan and the 1990 Institute I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, my partner and who has been uh, at this uh, the most, Sam Choi, who actually will be leaving the center tomorrow to uh, take up a position uh, at the local county government. So we shall wish him well and uh, hope he will come back and, and visit us often. Now, the a recording of this webinar will be available in the next few days, as I mentioned, on our website. And for next week, please join us next Thursday for a presentation by Peter Martin, a reporter with the Financial Times, about his new book, China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. So that's going to be another interesting topic. Thank you all. Thank you to all the uh, audiences who uh, tune in and have a good night and also have a good rest of the day for those from, uh, for Sean and especially. Thank you. <laughs>